Hi, good evening, everyone. Jason, hey, Dave. Good, how are you? Oh, good, thanks. Welcome Hi, to yet another stream um, of Disasters Deconstructed podcast today in collaboration with um, Radar. Um, we have a really exciting conversation for you installed today, uh, perhaps something different from what we usually discuss, um, yet really relevant to the our usual conversations on risk. Uh, so you've got something really, really fantastic to look forward to in the next 90 minutes. As always, uh, we will have some exciting speakers and I will talk to them in a second. And please pose the questions. We would be uh, grateful and we will be able to ask our speakers um, as well. So please post the questions wherever you're watching this live stream, on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, um, and we will ask our speakers later on. So today, as I already said, we teamed up with Radar. Radar is Loughborough University's Arts Commissioning and Research Program. And joining us today is David Bell. I don't know, somewhere <laughs> at the top of my screen there. <laughs> yeah. um, and also joining us today are Libby Hinley and Simone Antale, uh, who you will see in a second. Sorry, lost my script. Um, everybody's surprised by that if they know me. Um, so today we're going to talk about AI. And in recent years, artificial intelligence has staged a subtle revolution of ordinary life. So together with David Bell, we're very pleased to bring you the special live stream episode of Disasters Deconstructed, featuring the artist and quantum physicist Libby Heaney in conversation with the media theorist Simone Natale. They will be discussing the risks AI is supposed to mitigate of AI itself and whether AI might be used in the formation of new forms of belonging rather than in the service of division. And we're just so pleased to see this partnership come together and for this event to take shape. And so I'd now to like to invite David Bell to tell us a bit more about Radar and their work. Thank you so much, and, and thanks both for, for having us on and for organizing this. Um, so Radar is Loughborough University's Contemporary Arts Commissioning Program. Uh, so for those who don't know, Loughborough, um, it's a, a medium-sized town, I guess, pretty much bang slap in the middle of England. Um, and it's, you know, Loughborough University is, is um, quite a large university with an enormous campus uh, and, and you know, covers um, a, a wide range of academic subjects. And, and Radar's remit really is to commission artists to make new work alongside, in response to, and sometimes in provocation of academic research um, across the university. So across our Loughborough campus and also our, our campus in London. Um, the work we commission is normally uh, research-based, it's processual and it takes the form of events, workshops, performances, and sometimes film, less often, um, it's it's more traditional object-based outputs, so things like um, photographs uh, or, or kind of permanent artworks. Uh, but usually um, it's it's event-based or, or collaborative. Um, Radar is led by my colleague Laura Persklov, who's um, currently on maternity leave, so I'm the acting producer. Um, and a couple of years ago, Laura put together um, a program of commissions exploring risk and the kind of social, ecological, political, and economic relations that risk arises from and perhaps contributes to. So thinking about risk in its, in its kind of structural and political context. So risk is something that is reproduced by and reproduces um, the, the world in which we live. Um, and we were really pleased to be able to work with Ksenia, um, whose, whose academic work at Loughborough um, touches on a number of these areas to, um, and then commission artists to make work in response to those themes. So I'm not going to introduce each commission in turn. Um, have a look at the Radar website. If you just search Radar Risk Related, you'll be able to find details of all the commissions. But across the, the artists we've commissioned, they're exploring through music, video, um, participatory workshops, web-based work and performance, issues of risk as they relate to financialization, ecology, chemical experiments, including experiments in the lab, urban life, waterways management, invasive species, or so-called invasive species, uh, medical terminology, so the, the kind of risks inherent, or the, the communication of risk from a, a patient to a doctor, for example, or when describing symptoms, um, extraction, um, 
uh, the, the kind of colonial relations of extraction, uh, migration and borders, um, and more besides. So there's quite a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd really encourage you to, to check out the, the Radar website to, to learn more. Um, so we're, we're focusing today on, on one of the artists we've commissioned, Libby, who's, who's obviously joining us, uh, Libby Heaney. Um, and Libby's work, um, as we'll hear, Libby is um, an incredibly highly trained uh, quantum physicist um, who can code artificial, can code uh, machine learning AI. Um, and her work really explores both the um, divisive ways in which AI is often employed um, and the, the possibility or, or questions whether AI might be put to more um, hopeful use. So rather than kind of functioning to reproduce the status quo, whether we might use AI experimentally to create new forms of, of social relation. Um, so I think Libby's work, Libby will speak for herself, but I think Libby's work approaches risk in two ways. One, by thinking about the way AI manages risk in the service of, of the present very often. Um, but secondly, kind of taking a risk in the process itself. Um, and this is a collaborative work for Libby. Um, so she's working with the musician Libby Iqbal. Um, and we'll, we'll hear um, some of the work that they've been producing shortly. So the work itself, it's a musical work which um, is based around chanting. So both chants that Libby has recorded um, and, and chanting understood quite broadly. So football fans, religious chants, but also non-human chants, so birdsong um, and other field recordings. So Libby's recorded these, but she's also trained uh, a machine learning AI on these chants and then trained it to produce its own variations on these chants. And these sounds form the basis of the musical work. So there's a recorded extract or some recorded extracts from this work which are online now. You can find them through the Radar uh, website. They're on our Bandcamp page. And we're going to hear an excerpt from those shortly. And then um, hopefully in June, depending on um, uh, uh, COVID restrictions, um, we will have a, a live performance of this work in um, Emmanuel Church in Loughborough. Um, and I'm sure Libby can say a little bit more later about the, the kind of importance of, of the church as a site for that, but it really is intended as a live work, um, both so it brings people together through the, the sound itself, but through people being physically present um, in a space and in a space that, that is explicitly designed to, to bring people together uh, in, in collectivity. Um, so yeah, so that's that's a little summary of, of, of radar and risk related. Obviously, I'm happy to answer further questions if, if uh, viewers have any um, as the event goes on. Um, but yeah, really excited to um, to bring Libby's work into conversation with Simone today. Um, and and yeah, and, and and see where it goes. Um, thank, and Fantastic. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, all right. So we may be experiencing some technical uh, issues. <laughs> it seems to be um, a kind of a trademark of ours of these live streams, or perhaps all the live streams. Uh, but we will try. So you know, we might rearrange um, the order of things slightly. Um, but but let's see where we're going, and hopefully the internet gods are on our side for the next hour or so. All right. Um, so thanks for the introduction again. And um, I would like now to in introduce Libby Hini. Hi, Libby. Hopefully the internet stays with us. Let's try. Um, yes, I can see you. Hi. Hey, Max. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, brilliant. Hi. Hi. How's it going? Yes. I'm. I'm, I'm glad you're back. Glad you're um, <laughs> We've introduced you already, so I'll, I won't say too much. But um, as you audience already know, as Dave mentioned, our first guest today is Libby Heaney. Uh, Libby is an artist with a PhD in quantum physics who makes conceptual artworks with emerging technologies like machine learning and quantum computers. And um, I'm sure Libby will tell you more about her piece, The Whole Earth Chanting. And after Libby's um, little kind of presentation, we will get to hear a little bit of it. Over to you, Libby, please. Okay, thanks, uh, Ksenia. Um, yeah, so it's really great to be here today. So thank you to um, David and uh, Simone also for joining me in this conversation. So basically, um, as, as Ksenia just mentioned, my background um, is in uh, quantum physics, quantum computing, before I retrained as an artist. So I was really working on um, 
developing at some level these emerging technologies that when they're fully developed will probably change the world. And, and when I was working on these, developing these tools, what I really realized is that a lot of the scientists and technologists working with them weren't really thinking at all about the social or um, political impacts of the power and the modes of control that these new tools were um, could possibly bring. Obviously, it's with quantum computing, when I was working in it, it would have been quite spec speculative. Um, but it's very important to have these discussions early on before these tools get really embedded within our lives. So in my practice over the last um, so my art practice over the last like five years, I think, I've been working with different um, types of machine learning models. Um, I've really been interested in thinking about their agency in relation to our agency, kind of how do they act in the world to control us or not um, in various ways and how we can kind of start to, as artists, start to perhaps deconstruct some of the hierarchies, um, that these tools construct in different ways um, and how we can highlight um, some of their different modes of controls and, and so on. So what I'm really, so in the work, the whole, so over, you have to kind of think about the whole of chanting in the context of my um, art practice um, and these themes. So really, um, I was interested in a buff, book by um, Zuboff um, uh, called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, where she really talks about how machine learning algorithms that are usually uh, the most powerful ones are owned by the big tech companies and how ultimately they um, mean that we lose um, our agency and autonomy as they kind of act below our awareness. And we sort of lose this ability to self-determine. So the types of algorithms I'm on about are perhaps on Facebook, on Google, all, um, but they're more and more being deployed into the physical in real life spaces as well as just on the web. Um, so Zuboff writes about many different case studies to do with this. Another work uh, book that really influenced kind of my thinking around the whole of chanting was by uh, Virginia Eubanks. It's called Automating Inequality. And she really writes about how, um, particularly in the USA, how these algorithms are used to kind of, um, con I want to use the word recontrol or recriminalize the poor, because of course, um, kind of how how sort of different structures have been been sort of controlling the poor um, is it's not just a new thing but the data that AI is trained on always comes from the real world um, so from historical um, and cultural um, systems and these this data is often riddled with biases um, which and then when an algorithm is trained on these biases it's really kind of like you can't kind of there's no room for humans to move. They get fixed in these sort of very rigid categories. So um, Eubanks in her book really talks about how um, people are stuck um, in sort of these, these traps like homelessness or uh, not being not given the benefits that they are due. So they feel quite disconnected from society, um, there's a polarization between different groups, as we we've seen with Brexit and with the election of Trump in the USA. There's probably a tighter belonging within the groups, but then a bigger polarization between them. So the whole of chanting is really kind of about moving beyond um, these sort of structures and how the predominant use of machine learning technology. So the title, The Whole Earth Chanting, actually comes from Stuart Brandt's The Whole Earth Catalogue, um, which was part of sort of, well, Stuart Bank, um, Brandt was part of the 60s counterculture. Um, he was like a tech visionary who predicted the internet. And the catalogue was all like thinking about um, self-sufficiency and ecologies. Um, DIY sort of um, approach to things, systems, 
holisms. And I really like this idea of this interconnectedness of the world. So I thought about how we could use these machine learning algorithms. So in my case, I used um, a wave GAN. So this is um, a, um, a generative adversarial network, a neural network um, that can reproduce and recreate sounds. Um, but I was really trying to use it rather than to categorize or to represent reality as it is, to start to blur different systems together to create a um, new sense of belonging, not just between different groups, so sort of football fans um, chanting and uh, religious um, participants, but really with the world itself. So there's um, birds in there and also inanimate objects. So um, sounds from a rumbling of quantum physics labs. So rather than sort of polarization and loss of autonomy and, and segregation, I'm really thinking how we can use these tools um, to connect with I'm back. I think I just went there. Um, it's in the sense that kind of how can we have this sort of materiality of these sounds entering us and giving these new fleeting or performative moments of connection with with these different elements. So, for instance, um, how, so some of the questions I get asked while I'm talking about this project is kind of what, how do you define non-human chanting? So I was thinking about the spectrograms or visual representations of the sounds and looking at those quite intensely for human chants so each category of chant for human chants would be um, visually quite different but then I started looking at other sounds in the natural world from animals and um, across into the inanimate world and when visually the spectrograms look similar I'd be like okay I'm going to use that and to some extent that's why from a natural world there's only birds and from an inanimate world there's only kind of these um, sort of laboratory rumblings I've, I've got quite got a specific signature in their, free, like in their spectrograms um, I, I looked at many other categories but they didn't fit and I wanted to be kind of um, you know kind of have a quite a meaning meaningful definition of of chanting there um, what else did I want to say so um, so I trained um, a few different AI models actually on these sounds um, and eventually it could put the models could produce up to four second clips um, I'll talk a little bit more later about the risks in doing this but what I really wanted the reason I used a GAN is because you get this latent space uh, representation of sound so if you imagine a 3D room you know we're sit all probably sitting in indoors at the moment um, while you're listening to this imagine in one corner of your room maybe up high near the ceiling is like bird sounds and then down at the bottom of a room of a football chance and then you can imagine a line that uh, goes in between those so what i was encouraging the uh, machine to do as it as it was learning to chant was or after it learned to represent the sounds was to move from one point in the latent space representation to the other so you really get these lovely liminal liminal parts where one chant is turning into something else and this is kind of this this loss of categorization is really important to me because it's kind of anti what the big tech companies um how they use uh, machine learning so I think we're going to share some some of the sounds now, perhaps. Yes, thank you so much, Libby. Um, thank you so much for sharing this. And th there will be more opportunities for questions. I certainly have lots of questions, and I'm sure uh, the audience does as well. Um, but Dave, over to you, and we'll let you introduce the piece, please. Helps if I unmute myself. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, um, so I think I think probably uh, hopefully people have got a sense of of the kinds of ideas that this work is drawing on and the discourses that it's it's extending and and the practices that it's critiquing and perhaps trying to counter. Um, so I'll I'll kind of um, um, read a little bit from the kind of official blurb. 
um, just to, to capture the, the process as, as fully as we can. Um, so in the creation of, of the work that you're about to hear, Libby recorded various human and non-human chants um, and definitely took a risk by including the chanting of uh, West Bromwich Albion fans um, when the uh, person commissioning the work is a, a Wolverhampton Wanderers fan. <laughs> I did not know you were Wolverhampton fan when I did that, but it was brilliant when you well, recognised the West the baggy chance. Um, but yeah, we'll, 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 we'll let it pass. Um, and yeah, and then and then trained an AI program on these chants to to produce its own chants. Um, and then recordings of both the originals and the AI generated chants were passed on to Libby's collaborator, Nabiha Iqbal, um, who's woven them into a forty five minute work, um, which is designed to be played live through a dub sound system. Um, so in this, they, they take a risk with AI by opening it up to the unknown, the chance, and the new encounter, so as to be open to new modes of experience and relation through the power of voice, sound, and music. Um, and like I say, it really is a work that's designed to be heard live. So what you're going to hear now is a, a preview um, or, or, or a kind of excerpt of the live work rather than the work itself. Um, Can I say that's incredible, Libby? Um, we're we're so glad to share that with you all on this stream and have something totally different on our podcast. Um, amazing work, and thank you, Radar, for commissioning uh, this. And um, well, if anybody has questions for Libby and for some of you, please do pop them in the chat wherever you are watching the stream. Um, we can. We can bring them on screen and address those questions as they come in, um, but we'd love to hear from from you wherever you're. Working. So I want to transition now, um, and I have the pleasure to introduce Simone Natale. He is assistant prof uh, Sorry, he is associate professor um, in media theory and history, University of Turin, Italy and Principal Investigator of, of the AHRC-funded Circuits of Practice Project at Loughborough University. He's also Assistant Editor of Media, Culture, and Society. In his book, Deceitful Media, that we will be talking about today, Simone 
examines the rise of art artificial intelligence throughout history and exposes the very human fallacies behind the focusing specifically on negative AIs. He argues that what we call AI is not a form of intelligence, but rather a reflection of the human user. Using the term banal deception, he reveals that deceptions form the basis of all human computer interactions rooted in AI technologies. As technologies like voice assistants util utilize the dynamics of projection and stereotyping as a means for aligning with our existing habits and social conventions. By exploiting the human instinct to connect, AI reveals our collective vulnerabilities to deception, showing that the change that machines are primarily influencing rather than on other technology is on us as humans. Simone, thank you so much for being with us, and I'd like to invite you to share some initial thoughts on today's topic. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jason, and, uh, and thank you, Xenia, David, and uh, rather and it's actually constructive for inviting me it's really a pleasure to be here also it's a pleasure to uh, engage and uh, enter in dialogue with uh, this uh, amazing work and another reason uh, why i'm happy to participate in this um, podcast series is that i believe that um, actually one of the problems of uh, contemporary debates about ai also has to do with uh, a common misconception uh, uh, about the issue of risk and uh, deception. Yeah? That is uh, the, the, uh, the topic of this uh, uh, podcast. And I'll explain what I mean uh, with it by in a minute. Um, but uh, first, uh, I'll uh, briefly illustrate uh, the key argument that I developed in my book, uh, uh, The Seedful Media. So the book was, was born out of a deception with a recurring pattern that uh, one can observe in the public debate about AI. Discussions on AI are often dominated by two positions that uh, appear in contradiction with each other. So on the one side, uh, we have the enthusiasts uh, who tend uh, often to exaggerate uh, uh, the achievements of AI systems. And on the other side, uh, we have those who instead uh, denounce these uh, overstatement, these exaggerations, as a deceptive, and argue that uh, either AI in general or uh, specific examples of AI cannot be really understood as intelligent, but are instead uh, a fake, uh, a fraud, uh, or in other words, uh, a, a deception. So we can take, for instance, uh, the example of the robot uh, Sophia which uh, was created by a, a Hong Kong-based company called Hands of Robotics. In 2018, the government of Saudi Arabia did something quite uh, unusual. Uh, it uh, awarded uh, citizenship to, uh, to this robot, to Sofia. Um, and of course, this choice, this choice uh, attracted uh, much attention in, uh, in the media and also a good amount of criticism, and not only because many non-robotic people continue to struggle to be recognized as citizens in uh, several parts of the world, if not all countries around the world. Many in the AI community lamented the fact that uh, the robot Sophia crossed the line from artificial intelligence to deception. AI scientist Jan LeCun, for instance, who was the director of AI at Facebook, pointed out that Sophia is, and I'll use uh, his uh, uh, wording, complete bullshit, because its credibility depends on what you might call a cosmetic effect. Uh, Sophia is designed with a human-like appearance, uh, both in its body and face, as well as in its voice, so it can appear more convincing and lifelike to the public. And uh, even its public performances are very carefully dramatized by the company that produces Sophia to make it look smarter than it actually is. And that's why, according to Lecun, Sophia is uh, bullshit, not uh, real AI. But what I think is uh, missing here is uh, the acknowledgement of something that I, I think is of uh, crucial importance to understand AI. The deception is not an exceptional feature of AI. Deception is not, in other words, something that characterizes only specific uses or 
specific expressions of uh, AI technology. But it is ingrained in the very essence of what AI is and how it works. AI technology, in fact, always stimulate certain reactions in users and observers. And throughout the history of AI, developers have constantly tried to anticipate these reactions and also mobilize them, use them in order to achieve specific effects. And that's why, if we want to take up the word in use by Lecun, we could say that uh, there isn't AI without some element of uh, bullshit, without some elements of, uh, of proje projection and uh, perception and reaction that we project uh, onto, onto the technology. We can take uh, the instance of uh, voice assistants, such as uh, Apple Siri or Amazon Alexa, that uh, uh, some of us, some of you might have uh, um, used, might use every day. So the choices that uh, companies such as Amazon or Apple uh, did uh, about uh, the voice uh, to, to be assigned to uh, these voice assistants, for instance, uh, to go for human-like voices rather than uh, synthetic sounding voices, or the choice uh, to provide them with uh, precise connotations of gender and even of social and racial background, in, uh, for instance, in the accent uh, of this voice, uh, are never made by chance. Uh, they, they are choices that uh, derive from consideration that these companies make about how users uh, will react, uh, for instance, to a female uh, or to a male uh, voice. And in my book, uh, I define uh, such apparently inoffensive strategies uh, with the term of uh, banal deception. Because the deception of uh, Alex is banal, first of all, uh, since it has to do with situations that are immersed in our everyday life and we don't even perceive as uh, deceptive. Such ordinary and mundane character of banal deception makes it uh, unnoticeable, but at the same time, it makes it uh, full of consequences, since it allows this technology to enter into the deepest layers of our everyday habits and uh, behaviors. Now, to, to close, what does this uh, have to do with the topic of uh, disasters and risk? Well, in the public debate on AI, risk is often located in the possibility that the AI will reach certain threshold or tuning point, usually located in the future. For instance, if AI will reach consciousness, or if uh, the intelligence of machines will equal or exceed the intelligence of humans, uh, or if a conflict uh, may, may start uh, between uh, humans and uh, machines. Such an approach not only places risk uh, in the horizon of the future rather than uh, in the horizon of the present, but also, it does not take into account that disasters do not always or not only emerge as a consequence of uh, big events and turning points. They can also be the result of less visible and even ordinary dynamics. It is the famous uh, metaphor of the frog that is uh, often used in regard with global warming. If a frog is thrown in a pot of boiling water, it will immediately panic and try to escape. But if the same frog is put in a pot of cold water, uh, which is gradually warmed up, then the frog will not notice the gradual change in temperature until it, the, the, the temperature will uh, eventually kill uh, uh, the frog. So for what concerns AI, locating risk in the imagine moments uh, when AI would allegedly reach certain thresholds or turning points uh, as the result of obliterating other forms of uh, risk that are hidden in more mundane and apparently trivial dynamics of uh, AI, such as uh, what I call banal deception. In the sense, we need uh, a different consideration of risk in AI, one that recognizes also the potentially ordinary and uh, imperceptible of difficult to perceive the character of uh, disasters uh, and risk in AI. We need to be reminded 
In other words, the implications of AI are much more subtle and banal than they appear to be. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Simone. I'm not sure uh, whether I'm scared <laughs> or confused. I don't know. So many questions. Um, yeah, th this is fascinating. So thank you so much again, Libby and Simone, for your reflections. And um, well, we will take this opportunity as facilitators to start asking you some questions. And whilst we're doing this for, that, for our audience, please pose the questions if you have any. Um, I'm sure there is a lot of questions out there um, because this is something really quite fascinating and i think we've got a lot to unpack um i'll start since i'm talking i'll ask the first question and uh, libby i've got a question for you i'm really curious about your background so you studied physics um and now you're doing this amazing art so can you tell us a little bit about your journey how do you move from physics to ai and to art and how do you combine this all together Thank you. Um, so in my journey from, yeah. Um, so basically, you know, I guess it was um, when I was younger at school, I re it's a quite a simple explanation in some sense. I really wanted to train as an artist. But because I come from quite a working class background, um, you can probably hear my Midlands accent, my parents and teachers sort of convinced me that it would be quite a risk um, to go into art, you know, as sort of an 18 year old. Um, so I was very good at science and physics and so on. So I kind of took almost a diametrically opposite path. Um, but then I was kind of really got into quantum physics which is an entirely different way of seeing the world and compared to how we see the world every day and um, I was really fascinated by it and in some sense it, it connects very well with with contemporary art theory because it really really values kind of a plural and the entangled over and the subjective over kind of the ob objective rational um, truths um, so I, I did like a PhD, um, I was working on quantum computing, quantum, um, yeah, various things. But then I was always planning to go back to art at some point to kind of connect, connect these, these passions together. Um, so I suppose one of the, I mentioned already, one of the concerns I had when I was working in science um, and with quantum physics, quantum computing, was a lack of critical discourse about these really powerful tools we were developing. Um, so going back into art, um, I think it was eight years ago now, and retraining, I don't want to instrumentalize art as such, but it does offer a space where you can play with these ideas and be critical in really imaginative ways, um, as opposed to kind of, um, discussing things very didactically. So how, and then just to finish, how I came into AI was obviously, as a scientist, I was trained in coding um, and in mathematics. Um, so it came quite natural to me to then pick up and start working with neural networks when they kind of became more available um, a number of years ago. Um, so, but the way I really approach working with AI um, in the work of the whole of chanting as well, is to come at it from kind of a quantum perspective. So thinking about entanglements and pluralities and subjectivities, as opposed to kind of very individualist, discrete entities. So I think, I think things, in my mind at least, things connect together quite well. I I absolutely love this. I well I, I love your reflection on that kind of taking risk, you know, and I think this is perhaps what we're looking at today. But also I think your example is so fantastic in that why we should engage with imagination and creativity and also need to step away from our disciplinary silos, right? Um just because um we're just so kind of stuck and focused and you are the example of what amazing things can be achieved, you know, when we kind of allowed to get out of the box, I suppose. So yeah, thank you for that. And thank you for sharing this. You're muted, Jason. I am muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, to um, come to you, Simone. And um, in your book, having conversations with Siri. So I wanted to ask you about that. And um, 
like is there a risk in these conversations and where where can they take us talking to ai well thank you very much jason um, uh, yes in the book i i use a kind of a, um dialogues with siri um, in, a, in a similar way as a as a ventriloquist would uh, use a puppet uh, basically i i try to uh, ask different queries to to siri sometimes i found that one that uh, could fit with the narrative that was uh, um present in a chapter or in a part of the book and i inserted screenshots of these yeah to to in a way to to signal uh, key ideas and um uh, and uh, shifts yeah and in a way i think this um uh, such an approach is uh, uh which is quite playful yeah to with uh, with siri is uh, is fitting with uh, the way also we use these technologies uh, one of the the first ways in which people uh, use uh, these tools uh, is uh, uh, making jokes with them and laughing with them uh, in introducing them within a conversation uh, in a party or so with friends so there is this, this, this element of playfulness at the same time however um, we should also uh, consider that uh, although uh, even with this playfulness and the fact that these tools are extremely useful and extremely also productive to imaginative tools uh, we also should uh, remember that we have to take them uh, seriously and we have to consider also the risks that are associated to them and uh, so one of the risks for instance is um, is the fact that uh, uh, these uh, uh, tools are uh, interfaces that uh, uh, with which we can access uh, the web we can access uh, information news and so on yeah we can uh, if we make a comparison with uh, social media, some years ago when uh, social media were, were introduced, few, uh, if uh, known, uh, worried about uh, the implication of social media for uh, democracy, for uh, political marketing, and so on. Yeah? Now, some years ago, uh, later, we see that uh, there are a lot of concerns about uh, the potential impact of social media on issues such as uh, misinformation or um, or uh, <coughs> political advertising um, the same thing can also happen with these tools uh, um, and so it is it is uh, in this sense uh, very important to uh, to explore how uh, this tool can change how we access information uh, for instance you know if uh, if you search something on the web uh, on, for instance with google you will receive a number of results. If you do a search with a voice assistant, you will receive usually one result uh, because also the voice uh, cannot uh, account for, you know, for giving more choices. So this can restrict the information. And also if we consider that these uh, tools are managed by very powerful companies such as Amazon and Apple, there can be a bottleneck uh, in how how this information is offered uh, to the public. So this is just one, one example, one potential risk that, uh, that can be considered. So we have uh, these uh, two sides. So on the one side, uh, this very um, potentially useful, this uh, imaginative, also playful way in which we can engage and what we can gain from this technology. And on the other side, uh, this potential risk. I think that uh, uh, what we need is to reconcile these two, these two sides of the problem and the way in which we can reconcile uh, uh, these two sides is uh, basically know these these tools better reflect uh, uh, on how they work on how they impact on different uh, aspects of our life and our worlds and uh, try to uh, to build uh, uh, the most productive uh, way possible to to engage and to uh, also uh, uh, to police also and uh, um, shape uh, uh, this technology. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to slightly change tack here with the, the next question for Libby um, and, and kind of get into the, the, the process of making the work itself. Um, and I wonder if you could tell us about the, 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 the way or, the, or the, the process you've gone through to get the AI to chant. So yes. the creation project. And I remember when we were 
um, in the very early stages of, of thinking through the commissions for this, and, and Laura Persglove, Radar's producer, um, was very keen that, that as well as artists making work about risk, there are artists who incorporate risk into their practice, so they take a risk. And I think that that's maybe not the central um, meaning of your work, but it's certainly present. So it's it's a risky process. Um, so I wonder if you could could talk us through um, that process of of getting an AI to chant, um, and then doing that in a way that's kind of open to creativity, and and how you see that relating to, to the final work. Okay. So yeah, absolutely. Um, it was a risk um, to do this work in the sense that um, working with sound, um, generative models, AI models with sound is quite challenging. And I already knew that because when I made a previous work called Euro Revision, where I made myself into deep fake Theresa May and Angela Merkel, I'd also tried to convert my voice to sound like theirs as well. And what I didn't realize at the time was that for each word that I said, I'd need, I don't know, maybe thousands of copies of them saying that exact word. So um, I just had big data sets of their voices and it came out with hints of Theresa May, but mostly robot, which I know she is quite robotic, but um, it's not what I wanted for that particular artwork. So it got cut. So I came to um, Laura and obviously David as well at Radar, wanting to make this work with the concept behind it but i also knew that training um ai models on these huge data sets of sound was risky because i'd just been through it and it, it had failed but i wanted to try again and i think i quite quite often in my practice i work with this sort of i like to push the boundaries of technology um to to use it in new and creative ways but to do that, you have to take a risk, I think. I'm working currently with um, some quantum computing systems, I'm collaborating with one of the uh, big companies. And um, you know, no, as far as I know, no one's done, done some of these things before. And literally, I don't know what's going to come out. So that's, that's, I think it is the risk of, will it be meaningful for kind of the concepts you want to portray? And what are the production values of what you get out? Um, so obviously with this project, um, I'm working with this wonderful musician, uh, Nabiha Iqbal. And she is on Ninja Tune record label. She's pl like played all around the world, released um, critically acclaimed albums. And, and I didn't want to, at the end of the day, give her, um, to put it bluntly, a load of shit. <laughs> Imagine what she <laughs> would have thought about that. So there was a quite, in the early stages of a project, there was quite a lot of pressure on me to, to produce something good. Um, and then so I went, so after I, I've already spoken about how I de identified the non-human chanting and I understood at this point that I needed to make really, really, really big data sets. Um, so I was lucky enough to be invited to my football club, West Bromwich Albion, to go and record the fans. Um, I've done, I've, I've, I practice yoga, so um, in my yoga class pre-lockdown there was lots of kirtan chanting, so I was recording that visiting Kirtan London, recording this. But I have to say, in order to mitigate the risk, I did supplement some of this data from YouTube because um, the more data you have, the more, um, well, you've just got more sort of very slight variations and then the algorithm is able to learn the statistics of the sounds. And initially I started really using kind of quite like low quality models, maybe 15 kilohertz as, as a um, output free um, sample rate, I think. And obviously like stereo sound is like, or like the sound we usually listen to is 44 kilohertz. But then over lots of time during lockdown as well, I managed to get really good quality samples out. But each model, each AI model took about a month to train on my computer. Um, I wasn't going to train it in the cloud because if you're doing that much, um, to like yeah machine learning in the cloud it comes to like thousands of pounds and obviously i'm not willing to spend that that sort of money on on these things so yeah there's quite a lot of risk built into this but it means that i was really i think i have to say i was quite pleased with having a lot obviously not pleased with having a lockdown but the lockdown the first lockdown last year gave me a chance to kind of push it further um so there's a lot of like time would have been time constraints on it as well um, there's probably other risks in there, but um, it meant 
sort of going into these spaces meant I could get these really interesting sounds out and I it's quite yeah um these liminal hybrid sounds um came through yeah wow this is fascinating but also very risky uh, from kind of all points of view um an amazing process I, I really can't imagine and again thanks for for telling us more about that um I now have I guess quite a simple yet a difficult question for both of you Simone and Libby so is AI a form of intelligence or a form of deception Simone and I'll start with you I think you know, that's a um, that's a very uh, easy question. I'm I'm joking. It's a very complex <laughs> question. It has been asked uh, so much, and maybe one um, one way to, to to look for an answer uh, could be to take one of the first attempts to to ask this question, which is uh, um, Alan Turing's uh, uh, proposal of the Turing test uh, or uh, imitation game. I called it in 1950. So really, at the beginning of the artificial intelligence era. Uh, so uh, Turing, the paper where he proposed uh, the, the Turing test, uh, started the paper by asking the question, can machines uh, think? But then immediately after asking this question, he dismissed this very, this very question. Because the reason that uh, we couldn't find an agreement of, of, on what uh, uh, thinking means. So, so this question, uh, is useless, says uh, Turing. And he proposed, therefore, a, a substitution to this question, which is the Turing test, a practical experiment where you have a human judge who enters in communication with uh, an interlocutor. The human judge doesn't know if the interlocutor is uh, a human or a computer, and just by uh, having a conversation, a written conversation with the human judge, uh, so, sorry, with the interlocutor, as it would be a chat room today, uh, he or she, the judge, has to find out uh, uh, if she is talking uh, uh, or she's talking to a computer or to a human. And in the Turing test, uh, if a computer is able to trick uh, the judge into believing that uh, uh, it is actually a human, then it will have passed the Turing test. So now, um, the, the Turing test uh, very often is uh, interpreted as a kind of threshold uh, to understand when we will reach AI. Uh, if a computer will pass the Turing test, then we will have AI. But actually, the, the, the most interesting implication of the Turing test uh, is uh, that uh, Turing is suggesting that we shouldn't uh, look for an absolute uh, definition of uh, intelligence. But we should instead define intelligence from the perspective of us, the humans. Um, the, te the, the machine passes the test when a human judge uh, believes that it is intelligent. So when uh, it convinces a human that it is intelligent. So if we take this uh, point of view, we see how, uh, for instance, if we take an example of, uh, of uh, uh, AI generated art. Uh, uh, so there has been also attempt uh, to uh, to use uh, GANs, uh, machine learning, to uh, uh, for for uh, generating painting. Uh, AI created uh, uh, painting, and um, uh, so these uh, appear to many as uh, very creative, as artistic. Yeah, but it's always uh, um, we have we can always ask. Uh, what is that uh, lead us to uh, identify a, 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 an AI-generated artwork as uh, uh, artistic? For instance, if you put uh, one of these paintings in, a, in an art gallery, then it is uh, more likely that this, uh, 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 that this will be uh, considered uh, a, a piece of art uh, than if it is uh, found elsewhere. So, so the perspective of, of us, the humans, and how we project intelligence of on machines uh, is uh, is always something that uh, uh, actually so so uh, uh, in a way uh, according to if we take uh, the um, the uh, reasoning of Turing to, to its fullest consequences is what uh, at the end uh, uh, decides uh, so what is artificial intelligence we are always the, the 
the ones who, who decided. This is, this is fascinating. Um, Wow, okay, I, I, I have a lot to digest there uh, with my easy question to you. Thank you, Simone. Livy, the same question to you. So is artificial intelligence a form of intelligence or a form of deception? Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, I really like this question because I hadn't thought so much about deception in relation to artificial intelligence before, mostly thinking about it in terms of truth, which obviously is connected, but um, it just gives you, gives, me a slightly different provocation and when I was thinking about this um, I was thinking it is both and neither or a combination of both and it's all dependent on context so um, let me explain I think there's no clear-cut answer to that um, I mean I see artificial intelligence as um, very complicated statistics um, I think obviously the name that has been given um, leads to a lot of assumptions around it that are not necessarily true definitely not at the moment but you know a, a, an artificial intelligence mo a model can learn it can it can conduct logic it can plan it can problem solve them but all, this is all to do with the sort of input the intelligence from the coders the human coders and while like a model an ai model doesn't have emotional knowledge or self-awareness um, these might be in embedded within a data set so it could start to sort of recognize patterns that depend on emotional knowledge within say a human population um, in terms of deception it just makes me think of I mentioned this book um, earlier automating inequality by Virginia Eubanks and she really talks about how people who work with these systems deciding for instance who receives benefits or not they used to take each case on a case-by-case -case basis um, before AI was sort of brought in. But since AI was there, there's still these human caseworkers behind it, but they refer to these algorithms almost like, like a god or like a new religion. Um, so even if an algorithm is deceiving them, they believe it is true. Um, but then, um, you know, in terms of an art, art all art is um, a deception in some sense. Um, maybe a very fluid, performative deception. Um, I think I think illusion and deception is core to to most most artistic modes. Anyway, and truth it truth is a sticky subject, of course, in relation to that. Yeah, I you know I <laughs> I wish we could open this kind of worms right about the kind of the truth and power and risk. Um, one, one of my favorite subjects really um, to talk about, but perhaps that's for, for another live stream. And um, we actually have a question from Jenny. Um, Jason, over to you, I think. You, you're the question master, right? Yeah, thanks Jenny uh, for putting in this question. And she, she was saying um, that she really appreciated your music, Libby. And, but she wanted to ask how you would advise artists who want to experiment with AI to get started in the field. Yes, so, um, it used to be more challenging than it has been um, because you would really have to either code something up yourself or find some existing code online and hack it for what you needed. And this required some knowledge of like Python or another language that it was written in. But now actually um, you have this program co called Runway ML. So runway like an airplane runway. Um, can I type in the chat? Maybe maybe once I finish speaking, I'll write, write it into the chat there. Um, and it's really like um, a Photoshop for machine learning. And so you can play with some of the famous sort of models. Um, so there's language models called like GPT-2 is on there. Some of the GAN models that you can use to create deep sort of, um, you know, these very fluid, liquidy um uh, visuals that you get from from AI so and also very practical things like keying out green screen behind behind sort of um, people performing in front of a green screen so it's not just about kind of maybe using the AI for something that's very dedicated to the AI but sort of automating tasks that can be quite tedious otherwise but there's lots of um, lots of tutorials on YouTube to how to use runway and and um, so yeah I'd, I'd start there Thanks, Libby. Something um, that I wanted to ask um, maybe to Simone is about um, the potential for AI to 
to be harmful to humans. And I'm sure I'm sure many people remember the Microsoft bot that um, kind of went on a Twitter rampage and became very abusive, like interaction with users on Twitter. Um, and so, like, do you, do you think that AI can be harmful, maybe causing causing people um, like psychological harm potentially? Or do you think it will become or could become more harmful to humans physically or mentally? Oh, thank you, Jason. It's it's a really excellent question, and um, you know, of course, there are well, well first. Um, um, we should um, also mention that there is also uh, potential of physical harm, especially in the use of military applications for AI. So there are certainly, and uh, and you know, military a lot of AI tools can be used for military purposes. But um, if we look at um, at more um, uh, the psychological side, so uh, so well, um, there are a number of um, also of, uh, uh, technologies that are uh, that were developed also to uh, to potentially to uh, inform uh, the uh, psychological well-being of uh, of people, uh, for instance, uh, companion chatbots, uh, uh, companion uh, uh, robots. Uh, uh, so, so that uh, basically um, are used to uh, either as a, as way to to do kind of uh, psychotherapy. Uh, so, through for a chatbot that automatically provides. Uh, uh, some some queries of uh, or some reactions to to a user's query, um, or in a way give uh, uh, potential uh, companionship. Yeah, and an example of this is a is a, um, uh, is a chatbot. Chatbot is a is a program that uh, uh, is is able to um, simulate uh, conversation in a chat with with a with a human. Um, so uh, it's a chatbot called Replica, which is an app that everybody can can uh, uh, download from for free. It's quite interesting to try it out. And basically, it's uh, uh, marketed as a, as a companionship uh, tool. Uh, and um, you you actually uh, download the app, then you choose a name uh, to assign to this avatar, uh, to the avatar that you chose, and uh, and the avatar uh, talks to you and. Uh, uh, so um, about anything, and uh, of course, if you pay more, you can uh, also add the different uh, uh, functions, like different roles uh, that uh, that uh, your avatar will take, including being uh, your boyfriend or girlfriend, uh, um, and so on. So, so this is a, a quite interesting development, and um, um, again, so we shouldn't uh, just uh, so um, uh, think that this uh, uh, this is. Uh, Dangerous per se, uh, or harmful per se, but uh, we should also consider uh, so uh, how this is offered to the public, uh, uh, how this is presented, uh, uh, and, and how also uh, it can lead uh, to uh, develop also um, uh, projections. So in a way, misconception about uh, what what the, the app is able uh, to do, because of course uh, this. Uh, uh, these uh, uh, programs they don't uh, feel emotions, uh, uh, but they can simulate uh, emotions, and uh, and of course they can also inform uh, others uh, others emotions. So in this sense, uh, I I suppose that it, it can be harmful, and uh, the important thing is to is to try to 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 improve our knowledge of these tools and to and to um, take these tools seriously and uh, and make sure that you know they are. That they are they are used in a in a in a um, ethical way. Thank you, Simone. Thank you. Do you want to ask your question, David? Oh yeah, sorry, I missed my missed my missed my cue. Yeah, I, I, I'm, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm throwing a throwing a bomb into the mix here a little bit, but. Um, I, I'm interested for, for both Simone and, and Libby, and maybe I'll, I'll go to you first, Libby. Um, your approach to the with this project and, and a lot of your other work to the kind of dystopian applications or, or the kind of banally dystopian applications of, of AI that I think Simone has really nicely outlined. Um, 
is to, to use AI for more hopeful ends, so to try to foster new forms of, of community and, and being, and, and reconfigure AI for, um, I guess, um, more, yeah, more hopeful ends. Um, but I guess another, another kind of response to those dystopian, banally dystopian potentials and applications of AI is, is one of refusal or disengagement. And um, so you, kind of people like the, the feminist manifest no, who are a kind of group of feminist data scientists who argue for a kind of withdrawal from engagement with, not with AI per se, but certainly with, with um, a lot of the ways that AI is used and developed and, and to kind of step back from pushing AI further. Um, and then movements like neo Luddism, um, which, you know, advocate a, a kind of, um, inspired by the Luddites who, who kind of um, saw the machinery that was being developed at the time as um, hostile to their interests as workers. Neo-Luddism sees um, AI as something that's hostile both to our, our kind of um, working lives, but, but um, to other aspects of our life as well. So, yeah, I wondered how, how you, both of you see that. How do you navigate a strategy between refusal and reconfiguration? Okay, should, shall I start, Menya? Yeah. Um, so basically, it's, it's a really good question, and kind of one that I have thought about. On a pragmatic level, these systems are embedded within our lives, so um, it'd be, it is very, 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 at least in the West, um, it's very difficult to um, avoid them. I did have no phone for one year, which was wonderful. Um, it was stolen, actually, and then I decided just not to have, have a mobile, but... Um, <laughs> That obviously had problems at some point, so I'm back with one now. Um, but no, it's actually in, in work. So I've been working on the whole Earth chanting for a while now um, because obviously we want to perform it in real life because we think it's really important for the, for the performance. But since then, I've been making more screen-based works, thinking about um, biases in data sets to do with the body, how the body is seen by computer vision but then I've been trying to think about actually is inclusion in the data sets really that um what does that mean anyway and and one of the sort of obviously I'm a creative so I'm not suggesting this is a practical application but um I've been reconceptualizing the body reconceptualizing the body through the lens of quantum physics so thinking about um the body as something that is might be boundaryless um uh, how we how how we can see um how we might be connected to other entities how we might be connected to um other bodies and so on so i've been working a lot with images and really like using computer vision algorithms to see to sort of recognize bodies in images but then to use the other technology quantum computing algorithms to kind of scatter and disperse bodies and entangle them together and then the computer vision algorithms could no longer see them. So in some sense, there is a refusal there. Um, so I think, I think, I think, but I can, I can like, you know, imagine these sort of crazy futures as a, as an artist, as opposed to something that's very practical and pragmatic. So I'm looking forward to hearing what Simone says about these questions next. Well, it's, um, yeah, it's a uh, quite a uh, fascinating topic. Actually, I'm, I did a seminar in my teaching, uh, both uh, at the University of Turin and at Loughborough University. I did, I did a seminar about uh, the topic of disconnection, digital disconnection, and uh, uh, with the students. Um, so we conducted uh, an experience of the disconnection. Basically, uh, the students and uh, myself were asked to uh, to disconnect partially from uh, from social media and uh, from mobile media for a week. And uh, it was quite interesting because actually we, I didn't give them the, the rules to do that, but we discussed together what would have been the, the rules. And then uh, we did this experience. And, uh, but uh, um, I mean, the purpose of this uh, uh, experience wasn't much to, to say, you know, we have to pull out because uh, social media are dangerous. Yeah? But uh, it was more the idea that uh, if you pull out for a moment, uh, you can, uh, notice something that uh, you usually don't notice in your everyday life uh, uh, because of when when something is absent you you understand what is uh, what is there you know when when this is this is there so so we use this experience to reflect on our use of social media 
and in a way to uh, to improve our um, understanding, our our uh, self reflection, yeah, on uh, on social media. And in this sense, uh, I think that uh, uh, this kind of uh, informed uh, refusal is very is, can, can be useful because it's uh, it's it's a kind of uh, it's being active. Uh, uh, so in our relationship with technology, um, but it's particularly useful when it is uh, a way also to, uh, to 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 look so part of a path to understand how how technology works. And uh, in this sense, I really um, I really like what uh, what Libby is doing also because uh, uh, it's about you know knowing better these technologies can help uh, uh, develop. Uh, um, Better critical approach, more critical approaches, and more uh, um, approaches that are more able to to mitigate risk, to uh, to shape uh, better uses of technologies, and to also to monitor what's happening in the technology field. So, so if you really are able to engage with the technology, then uh, you are, we will be able to connect or to disconnect in a in a more uh, active and more uh, uh, understanding and uh, reflective uh, uh, way. So I, okay. If I could stay with you for a second, I know in your book you talked about the way that that those working in this area have, like from the very early days, been exploiting the limits of our perception and our intellect, and um, that kind of Cause us to think of like how is AI being used to um, to profit? You know, used to make us into the ideal consumers. Um, and you you talk about um, be us being programmed to be deceived. And I think that's a really interesting way to to think about humans. And um, yeah, like to what extent do you think those promoting AI and trying to integrate it into all of our daily activities have the intention to um, profit from us. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, well, first, like um, you know, my, my my general point, my overall point is that uh, um, it's uh, the question is not uh, if AI is authentic or if it is a deception, because deception is part of AI. Basically, because uh, it's not just the technology. The technology doesn't work alone in the world. It always uh, interacts with people. And uh, we, as people, always uh, project uh, sense uh, meaning onto technology. And this sense of meaning that, that, that we project uh, informs our own interaction with technologies. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, so very early, um, artificial intelligence uh, and computer sci uh, scientists and computer scientists uh, understood that and uh, and uh, you know uh, also integrated uh, their expectation of how people uh, react to specific uh, um, uh, so uh, inputs or design features uh, into the very the, the, the technology itself. So so my point is that we cannot separate uh, um, this element from uh, from. Uh, uh, from AI as a technology, so the reception is part of the AI technology, and I think you know that uh, this consideration also means that uh, um, that it's not uh, um, uh, that deception per se is is not uh, uh, bad. It can also be used in productive ways. Uh, just to make an example, if when we go to the cinema, uh, we are uh, captured by what we, we are seeing. We are, uh, uh, so we feel uh, that uh, uh, emotions uh, for what we are seeing. And this is, uh, um, this is uh, uh, something that is the result of uh, a particular uh, ways in which uh, cinema works. Uh, the fact that we have you know, in a dark room uh, and we have, uh, so, so we concentrate, we focus on, on what we see and uh, all also the the cinematic tools that are used to in narrative to uh, uh, to create motion to give to to provide so to give an emotional meaning yeah, to to the images and uh, it's a, it's a good thing that we are we can participate uh, 
in this product of fiction, yeah? So, so it's not that the deception is, uh, is uh, bad per se. The problem, I think, is to understand uh, how deception is used. For instance, uh, if uh, um, uh, the empathy that uh, we might uh, um, uh, have for, uh, uh, for robots or for uh, uh, computer programs that uh, simulate sociality, if this empathy is used as a way to uh, provide uh, uh, some emotional uh, um, uh, so, um, uh, uh, advantage, some emotional experience uh, for us, this can be uh, something that is uh, feeling and is, uh, and is useful, uh, like, uh, like going to the cinema. Uh, but uh, if uh, this empathic feeling, for instance, is, uh, is uh, 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 mobilized to sell a product or to uh, do uh, political marketing yeah, by, by you know, mobilizing this. This can be dangerous. For instance, uh, there is an example recently in, uh, in Israeli elections, one of the many Israeli elections that have been in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, um, uh, they, um, the, the Netanyahu uh, campaign used uh, a bot uh, that uh, impersonated Netanyahu. The bot didn't pretend to be Netanyahu on Facebook. It, uh, it disclaimed yeah, that it was uh, a bot. However, it uh, still used the name of uh, Netanyahu and it still appeared as, uh, as responding. So it could still uh, create a feeling that, uh, you know, that is uh, a more personal way to, to reach uh, uh, so, so the user. And uh, so, so such, uh, such use of technology potentially can be quite uh, powerful and quite uh, uh, dangerous. Thank you so much. So, um, yeah, I really like that, that kind of, that double-edged na nature of deception as something that, that can be pleasurable, but, but also put to kind of nefarious ends and, and maybe sometimes at, at the same time. Um, the question I want to ask next, and it's, it's primarily for you, Libby, but, but Simone, you feel, obviously, please feel free to come in as well. And it's, it's, it's partly a follow-up um, to, to my earlier question. So it's, and it's partly drawn on an experience I had quite a while ago when I was um, working on a project in a, in a, in a previous lifetime, um, which was, it was a kind of an, an artistic research project that was um, in part exploring the development of, of Nottingham's creative quarter, which we saw very much as um, an attempt by capital and, and by landlords to kind of take the labor of artists and creative workers in Nottingham um, to increase the rental value of, of property in the city. So essentially, you know, celebrating the creativity of Nottingham in order to make more money for, for landlords. That's, that's a slightly... Um, Slightly uh, uh, reductive reading of, of, of what happened, but, but, but the, the core of our critique. And what we found was we did quite a few events, including artists, and they often took place in this nascent creative quarter. And we found that no matter how critical we were, people involved and people more celebratory and the creative quarter itself would, would really celebrate this. They would be like, great, this great thing's happening, come along. So no matter what the content of our work was it was still turned against us and i wonder whether given the amount of money that um you know ai big, big tech um kind of uh, not not to you particularly but throws at the arts in general um, and 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 um it's certainly interested in commissioning artists i wonder if there is, is there a risk that even work which is intended to critique the dystopian applications of ai ends up kind of being incorporated by the the corporations that are pushing that that um, that approach. Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, it's a well known strategy, isn't it? Uh, um, sort of neoliberal institutions use the arts to kind of what's the word? Um, smooth things over. Like there's many different uses um, to sort of look critical so there's a, I guess there's a sort of deception there but really they're sort of reinforcing their own power and status by doing that um yeah I mean obviously there's google arts and culture that throw so much money at the machine learning um artists and um some some um are more critical others aren't but 
I, I don't I haven't worked with them um, so I don't know what the contract terms are um, I know when I've worked with other big companies and sometimes in the contract there's um, certain clauses that um, you have to abide to um, but I think there always is always that risk um, you know with my I guess it's, it links think is like what is art what is entertainment and there's all that's something that I think um, especially with works that are more accepted. So as an artist, you're thinking, or at least I'm thinking about how my work might be received by groups that don't necessarily experience that much contemporary art. That's why I really like the idea of getting West Bromwich Albion fans singing in this quite um, unusual artwork, the whole of chanting. Um, but then at what point does it roll into entertainment and it ends up reinforcing the values of, of um, you know, of kind of, just a sort of a usual neoliberal agenda so i think i think i mean nabir and i spoke about this a bit in the sense that there are points within the um i don't know if on the ex excerpts but within the wider 45 minute performance where it feels quite uncomfortable there's something quite there's a bit where there's like some bird chanting going on and but then there's an ai bird chanting and i think she deliberately selected a clip that had some sort of glitch within it and then it makes you think kind of what have we done to the world when there's this sort of fake bird sound coming through and it's the feeling is quite odd um so i think it isn't just pleasure i think the whole work isn't just pleasurable um there is that sort of other side where it tips a little bit to counter this sort of like oh great an AI can chant you know that type of thing so so hopefully but it is always a risk yeah I don't and I don't think I think we just keep trying new strategies um and and until you until you settle on one that you think is I mean yeah you don't settle do you as an artist you keep trying new things <laughs> Amazing. Wow. Um, Simon, do you want to come in? No, I just wanted to say that, you know, yeah. it's a really fascinating issue and it's about the fact that uh, whatever we do, you know, if we write a book or if we uh, do an artwork or if we uh, build a technology and so once once it's out there, then we don't have control on it. We don't have full control on it and it can be interpreted in very different ways. So. So I guess it's a it's a um, uh, it, it's a quite uh, interesting uh, question, and it, it has ramification for art, but also for you know technology designers, uh, uh, architects, uh, uh, researchers, uh, scientists. Uh, I think it, the important thing is to ask uh, ask uh, ask some question about what we are doing and uh, about how this can be uh, can be received and. Uh, uh, and what what it can it can mean uh, to 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 poop the public and to people absolutely thank you so much this is a fantastic closing to this live stream um libby simone thank you so much for your time and for all this thought-provoking reflections um that you've provided today um amazing absolutely amazing i've enjoyed this thoroughly and thank you so much david uh, and Radar for bringing Vivi and Simone to Disasters Deconstructed. Jason, I really appreciate it. Um, to our audience, um, please check the links to Vivi's work uh, and to Simone's book on Twitter. We've already efficiently uh, posted the links. And also please have a look at the other risk-related projects that Radar has commissioned. There is a lot of fantastic stuff out there. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Our next live stream will be on the 2nd of June when we will be discussing our book group. Uh, it is a choice of uh, Claudia Santos, our follower. And we will be talking about Chino Achebe's Era of God. And we will be joined again by our comrade, um, Darren Alexander Williams, uh, whom, as you know, co hosted this season with us today. Um, some of you may also know that season three is coming to the end. We only have two more episodes to go before we come back with season two in June. Uh, so please follow us and listen to Disaster Deconstructed podcast on any platform that you use to listen to the podcast. So thanks very much again. And I hope to see you all soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. It was really a pleasure.